quite a few announcements today, so please do bear with me. Um, tonight is our carol service uh, with refreshments before it, which begin at 6 o'clock. Uh, so the refreshments at 6 o'clock and then 6.30 is the main carol service. So there'll be a few people taking part tonight, uh, doing readings, and also we'll have a duet as well. And in case you're wondering, no, it's not Terry and Alfie, uh, but uh, we hope to have a couple from Hamilton Road uh, coming along to sing as well. And this will be a good opportunity to invite others. It'll be a bit more of an informal night as well, too, with refreshments at the start and and more of an epilogue at the end. So please encourage others to attend that this evening. It'll be great to see you there. And as I say, just note the the time. So 6 o'clock for refreshments and then 6.30 for the main service. So I want to thank you all as well who've been giving a hand, uh, giving out invitations. I know some of you have given them out to your family members and neighbours even as well. And there's others been going out around the streets and even in the market um, as well too. And it's, we've had an encouraging response from that. And I know some have had some really good conversations from that as well too. So do just pray about that. Pray that people will accept those invitations and come. Uh, Tuesday night at 8 o'clock is our prayer and Bible study. And then on Saturday, there will be a short Christmas Day service beginning at 10.30. And then on Sunday, Boxing Day, we'll have a service on Sunday morning only at 11 o'clock. And uh, there are some other things as well just to announce today. And that's these, you'll see these little calendars. So these are children's calendars. Emma's been giving these out in the schools uh, all this week. So there are numbers she has left over. Uh, So if you'd like to take them for your grandchildren or maybe some of your neighbor's children as well, you'll find some of them, uh, some of those at the back as well. So there are children's calendars to give out and use them as a a little evangelistic tool, even on your neighborhood around you. So they're just sitting on the back table. Feel free to take those and also have a card as well. Sincere thanks to all who prayed, phoned, sent cards and expressed their sympathy. Following the sudden home call of my sister Maybeth, your thought, thoughtfulness is much appreciated. And then Psalm 116, verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And that's from Alfie and Kathleen. So some wider association news as well we want to mention. On Tuesday night past, we were playing just a number of these association videos over the last little while. And Tuesday night was the Baptist Women's one. And we were uh, announcing about a Bible study. It's an online Bible study beginning on the 10th of January on the first uh, three chapters in Revelation. So you can register for that online now, ladies. And then the other thing is that the 5th of February is the Baptist Women's Conference with Jenny Ortland at Ballymena Baptist. And again, that's both in person and also online as well. So you can register for those even from now on. So that's on the Irish Baptist uh, uh, Women's uh, website. And then also the Baptist missions are doing uh, a, little prayer, a little devotional every day, a Christmas devotional. And today's was from David Dixon and the Shankill Community Fellowship. But every day leading up to Christmas, they're doing that. So look out for that on YouTube at the Irish Baptist Missions page. And finally, this is the, the last announcement today. I just want to remind you that we are still remaining, uh, re- maintaining social distance in the church and would encourage people to stay within those social bubbles while at church. And this is for your own safety and also for others too. And please do remember everyone's circumstances are different as well. And we still require you to wear masks while singing and also when moving around the church uh, and less exempt. So as you know, a new variant has emerged and it's still on the the rise, but they're still gathering data as to the severity of this. And so the executive as yet has not provided any new um, regulations for churches. Uh, But as and when this will be provided, we will respond to that accordingly. And we do expect other announcements even being made in this week ahead. So do pray for our government at this moment. I think it's one of these situations, whatever way they they move, they're going to face criticism in whatever way they go. So please just pray for wisdom and also pray for wisdom for others even as we respond to this as well too. So just keep even our, our government in your prayers. So we will respond to that accordingly even when that is given to the churches again. But over these last number of weeks, we've been spending Christmas in Isaiah And we'd seen the expectation of the prophet as we looked forward to the Messiah's coming. But as we prepare to worship this morning, I want to read some verses from 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. So 
So as we saw of the prophet's expectation of the Messiah, it reminded me of these verses in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. I want to read from verse 10 to 13. Or verse 10, sorry, to 12. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. And you know, just thinking of that sense of expectation that Isaiah had, You know, the salvation that we can now benefit from and read of in God's revelation and his word, it's something the prophets longed to see. It's something Isaiah uh, longed to see. They wondered how these things would come to pass, the sufferings of Christ and even the greater salvation that the, the Lord had promised. And it was something even the angels longed as well. And I wonder sometimes, do we realize the great privilege which is ours? That we have actually, we know of something that has been long anticipated And we're going to begin this morning by singing of the first scene of rejoicing when that good news was first proclaimed. Our opening hymn focuses on the different responses to the birth of Jesus, from the angels to the shepherds and the wise men, but it also challenges us about our response too. So let us come worship the Lord. This is Angels from the Realms of Glory. Let's stand and sing this together, please. From the realms of glory, wing your flight over all the earth. Ye who sang creation's story, now proclaim a Messiah's birth.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you that we can come today and worship you. We give thanks that you sent Jesus to be our Savior, that he came into this world, Lord, just as you said, that he completed even that work of atonement you called him to fulfill, and that because of his perfect life, death, and resurrection, we can be reconciled to you. Lord, we ask that you would help us as we seek even to share the good news of the gospel even with others this Christmas season. We pray for those even who have received invitations and uh, these little tracts as well that we've been giving out. For those who were spoken to on the doors and at the market and around neighborhoods as well. We pray that those invitations would be accepted, that people would come along to our carol service tonight. And we want to thank you, Lord, for your, your gracious provision. And Father, even just for how even we are able just to, just to have these opportunities to reach out. And Father, although we are just wondering of what days are coming, Lord, we know, Lord, that you're the one who knows all things. And Lord, we do ask that you would grant us wisdom as well, grant us help. We pray for that wisdom for our executive as well, as they seek to respond to this uh, new variant and the data they gather. Father, enable them to make those wise decisions and grant us all wisdom in how we respond to it as well. May people see, Lord, that we are a people who also have a great hope. And Father, help us never to become uh, despairing, Lord, even in the situation of the world. We still have faith, Lord, in you. And Father, we know that one day all these things will be made new. Lord, help us, even in the midst of this pandemic, Lord, that others would see the hope within us. And even as we declare of that tonight, Lord, grant us even just, grant us maybe even opportunities just to chat to someone, even maybe sitting not too far away from us, or grant us opportunities maybe in those coming and going even from the service. But Father, be glorified through us. We do want to give you thanks, Lord, for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And Father, we ask that amidst these difficult and trying times, Lord, Let us never lose sight of it. Let us always be reminded, Lord, that none of these things surprise you. And Lord, things are moving according to your timetable. But Father, just help us as we seek to honor you, as we seek to glorify you even through that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to sing another hymn. We'll just stay seated as we sing this. This is the first Noel the angels did say. Let's stay seated as we sing this together, please. The first Noel the angel did say was to Bethlehem shepherds in fields as they lay in fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so
Well, over the last few weeks, we've been spending Christmas this year with Isaiah, and we're turning this morning to Isaiah 11. And through his prophecy, we've been getting a sense of the expectation of God's coming Messiah and what that meant even to the children of Israel. And uh, Isaiah, as he described God's chosen one, already there'd been several surprising things uh, which Isaiah had said about him to the people. They were awaiting this Messiah, this deliverer. But yet, as Isaiah shares of it, he, he, he says that God is going to give his people a sign and that was going to be a child that we were born. That was a, in many ways a surprise to them that that would be a child. He wouldn't come as a, a mighty warrior, but as a child. And that child would be born, and this child would be Emmanuel, meaning God with us. It was a reminder for the people that God hadn't left them, though they were facing difficulty from an enemy, the Assyrians, who were getting ever closer. Yet it presented them with a challenge to trust in them, or to trust in him, sorry. And then last week we saw this hope in Isaiah 9 described in even more detail and how the one who would come would display great wisdom and power. He would be uh, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God. He would be like to the people like an everlasting father and also a prince of peace. And when he comes, he will establish even a reign of peace. But what Isaiah initially stated in chapter 7 and what he expanded on in chapter 9, he even considers now the full implications of this as well in chapter 11. Because he pictures in more detail now what his coming will mean. And also the kind of kingdom that he will usher in. So let's read Isaiah 11 verses 1 to 10. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. And a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the adder's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. And this is the word of God. Before we turn to God's word together, we're going to sing another hymn just now. And this is joyful, joyful We adore thee. We'll stand as we sing this together, please.
pray together as we turn to God's Word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks that you are a God who is worthy of all praise. We give thanks, Lord, that you give us reason to have true and lasting joy, that we can know of sins forgiven, and that we are a part of your family. There are many other reasons, Lord, that we can have this deeper joy and help us to be mindful of that even this Christmas season and not get caught up in just all the trappings, but to be reminded of the true message this Christmas. But Father, we all are also we're mindful of those for whom even this Christmas will be a difficult one, for those who mourn, for those who feel lost, particularly at this holiday time. Lord, continue to uphold and to, to comfort them. We pray for those also who are undergoing treatment for, or for those also who have even health concerns as well. Lord, continue to strengthen and sustain them as well and also their families too. But Lord, once more, give us that sense of, of expectation even that the children of Israel had as they long for the Messiah. And so, Lord, increase our longing even for him even today as well too as we long even for the Savior, as we long to see all these things even in their fulfillment as well. And so, Father, just speak through your word. Speak to our hearts today and through your Holy Spirit, Lord, apply them to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, you know, there are certain images which perhaps remind us all of Christmas and advertisers use them all the time in uh, posters and, and signs and Christmas cards. And, and Christmas cards, there's certain things you're used to always seeing at Christmas. Images like the, the holly and the ivy, or uh, else what about Christmas lights or you know Christmas trees, things like that. But the image we define described in verse 1 of, chap of, of, of chapter 11 of Isaiah is one that maybe you don't normally associate with Christmas. I don't know about you, but I haven't exactly got a card like that with a stump on it and a little branch. Uh, and if someone gave you one of those, a card like that, you'd be thinking, what is all that about? But yet we see it is an image that speaks of Jesus, this image of the branch. It's a very important picture, not only to the people of Israel at the time, but also it's written for us also. It applies to us too. See, this image emerges from a section of the prophecy of Isaiah where the prophet has been conveying the news even of God's judgment. So the Assyrians had been getting ever closer to Judah and other area after area was falling to them. Um, it's important to note that the Lord had permitted this to happen in order that the Lord would humble his people and to bring them back to him. The Lord, through this difficult time, was actually bringing about a greater purpose. Uh, the Syrians, you see, were a brutal, proud, and powerful nation. And they ruthlessly dominated all they had been in contact with. And for the children of Israel, some of them were wondering, you know, what about the future? The future for them looked bleak. The enemy was getting closer. The king had been unable to protect his people. And remember it said King Ahaz was quite a young king at the time. He was quite inexperienced. And we see in 2 Kings uh, uh, chapter 16, King Ahaz thought to himself, maybe if only I try and even bribe the Syrians off. And that's what uh, King Ahab tried to do. But that wasn't working. But what happened was in chapter 10 of Isaiah, the Lord promises that he would intervene. He would actually stop the Assyrians. And he was going to judge them uh, for their sin and wickedness. And in chapter 10, you find this image of essentially a forest with fallen trees. He basically says their trees are going to be cut down. These people are going to be cut down. But here's the thing. The Lord had cut them down because they'd sinned and rebelled against them. And these people, the Assyrians, are ultimately also, uh, this forest image is going to be applied to Israel as well. Even Israel, some of Israel is going to be cut down as well. See, they had sinned and rebelled against God. And they would eventually, as we know, be taken into captivity by the Babylonians. God's judgment was going to come upon them. But there was a key difference between what was going to happen when God was going to bring his judgment upon these two nations. The Syrians, you see, were going to be cut down. 
And God was going to permit the forces of Babylon to come in and basically wipe out uh, Assyria. So Babylon, Media, and Persia were going to be God's instrument of judgment upon the Assyrians. But when Assyria was cut down like this, they were never going to be heard of again. But when Israel was going to be cut down, some of the people were going to be cut down. There is going to be some life. There was hope remaining for Israel. Because God promised there'd be a remnant. There would be a remnant of his people. A new life was going to come from that remnant. So though Judah is facing a bleak circumstance, all is not lost. There is hope. God still has plans for his people. This is a picture of hope amidst judgment. Let's consider what this means to Israel and what this means to us. I want to look at really three headings. But as usual, sometimes when I say three, you might have a few underneath, a couple of the other ones. But don't worry, we'll still get you out in time for your lunch, okay? We're, the first heading we want to look at is Jesus the promised king. Jesus the promised king from the stump of Israel, from the stump specifically of Jesse. There's going to be a shoot. A branch from his roots will bear fruit. And for Isaiah, these images of the, uh, the branch and the stump even as well are going to be familiar because you actually meet them earlier in this book. Now, we haven't been going chapter by chapter through um, Isaiah's prophecy. But if you're reading chapter by chapter, you'll actually see this image mentioned before. In Isaiah chapter 4, verse 2, uh, the prophet refers to this image of the branch as a picture of God's saving work for his people. And the branch speaks of, though the beginnings maybe seem maybe un- unimpressive, the triumph that's going to come from this branch is going to be beautiful and glorious. So there's a message of hope there. In Isaiah 6, 13, we find the image of the stump again mentioned there. And the image of the stump there represents the, the remnant, those, the faithful remnant of the nation. And they are going to find life and blessing in God. So though God will judge his people, and though they will be brought low, they will be humbled for a season. They were going to be, remember, taken into exile. And though we be brought low, a faithful remnant would remain. And from this holy seed, a new people were going to grow. Notice how this image speaks of humility. This speaks of humility here. This life was going to emerge from the stump of Jesse. And Jesse, of course, was the father of David, one of the, most, uh, one of the greatest and most revered kings of Israel. Yet Jesse and his family, think of even their humble beginnings. They weren't from royalty. They were just a humble family, farmers, uh, shepherds. And yet from this family, God chose David to be a king. So Jesus also would come forth in humility as well. And notice the image that's used in verse 1, they'll come forth a shoot. Just like that little image I had before of the, of the little shoot springing out of the stump. A shoot, when you look at it, it seems frail. It seems even helpless. And yet when you think of how that prophecy was also echoed elsewhere in Isaiah, Isaiah 53, how Jesus would fulfill that. He would come into this earth as a, a baby. Isaiah 53 talks about he would grow up before him like a young plant, like a root out of a dry ground. He had no former majesty that we should look on him, no beauty that we should desire him. And Jesus, God's Messiah, fulfilled that. He came as a, as a helpless baby. Now, now think of that, that the Son of God, the one through whom even the worlds were made, the world was made, came as a baby, needing to be fed, needing to be changed. In many ways, it boggles the mind, doesn't it? But yet that is God's plan. That was God's way. Jesus took on our humanity as well. He took that on. He came even to be born into a humble family in a common town. The one who made that promise that God made to David also from his line that another would come. This was in fulfillment of that. He came into the line of David as well. And his throne that's going to come from, from Jesus is going to endure forever. We'll talk about that more later. Do you know when you think of it, so many kings had come after David. And with every king, those people must have thought, maybe this is the one. Maybe some of the kings started off well. Maybe like Solomon. They thought, oh, look at that man with wisdom. and Look at all the things he's built. Surely this is the one God has promised. And yet... We know Solomon was far from perfect. Some kings even came who were wicked as well. 
The promise, you see, was only realized in Christ. Unlike the king, a king Ahaz, Christ was going to be fruitful. He was the promised king, but not only that, he's the perfect king. Look at verses 2 to 5 here, and notice how this king is described. And the first thing you see is out of this, he's a spirit-empowered king. He's a spirit-empowered king. The spirit of the Lord is going to rest upon him. Now, normally in Old Testament times, the Holy Spirit would, would come upon saints to equip them for service. So to equip them for a certain function or role. Uh, so like Moses or, or Joshua, uh, the Spirit empowered them to fulfill their task as well. But yet, the Lord would impart his Spirit on this one. And he would be filled by the Spirit. He would possess the Spirit in a, in a greater way than any before ever had. He's going to be different than all the other descendants of David. Most of those descendants of David before were self-seeking, fearful and even cruel as well. But the Spirit of the Lord, he's going to be different. He is going to be different. He won't be self-seeking. He will actually give of himself. And notice how it talks about the Spirit here. He'll possess the Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. Things which are, are necessary for any king. To have wisdom and understanding. And you might ask, what's the distinction between the two of those? Well, wisdom is the capacity to, to have the right judgment in all things. And make right decisions. Understanding then is to be able to see to the heart of an issue. And these were two things that when you think about it, King Ahaz lacked. The wisdom of Ahaz had led him foolishly to try and bribe the Assyrians. And that hadn't worked. It hadn't worked. God needed to intervene for his people. Yet the promised king is going to have true wisdom. The promised king is even going to be able to discern the hearts of men. He'll even be able to see. And when he sees people, he actually know of their, their motives as well. He will know of these things. He will even possess the spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of counsel is about the ability to see the right course of action to take. And the might even re referring to the ability to carry that course of action through. Because you know sometimes kings and sometimes governments and, and world leaders can talk about a course of action. But yet sometimes they break their promises. Sometimes they don't actually have the ability to carry out those promises. But this king who will come will. I mean, you think about it also, earthly kings have a, a whole series of counselors and advisors. You know, we don't need to uh, tell you that. You see it nowadays even as well, even with our, our prime minister. He has a whole series of advisors. Anytime he makes a, a briefing now, they stand either side of him. They advise him on certain issues uh, as well too. But kings in those days would have advisors about lots of different subjects. And yet this one doesn't need to consult others. He possesses the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the ability to carry these things out. But also he possesses the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And God through his spirit, you see, it's the spirit of knowledge because he will have a, a close and personal, intimate knowledge of the Lord, this one. Because he, he knows God the Father in such a closer and deeper way. Because he is God the Son. And he will live in, in reverence of him. He will live a holy life, that perfect life. The only one who lived that perfect life. You see, when you think about all these attributes, these were things that the kings of Israel were supposed to have. Wisdom, understanding. They were supposed to have counsel and might. They were supposed to know the Lord. They were supposed to also walk in godly reverence of the Lord and to lead the people in that way too. But Jesus is one who possesses all these things. He embodies these perfectly. There are some who notice um, and, and note that there's actually a, a sevenfold mention really here. While we have the six attributes given, there's also the spirit of the Lord spoken of resting upon him. So the spirit of the Lord really is spoken of seven times here. Seven being the number of perfection. Showing us and pointing to us how this one who will come will be perfect in all his ways. He is the one who the Spirit of God descended upon even upon his baptism. The one whose life even depended on the Spirit. The one who himself said in Luke 4 verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me 
because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. People, even when they heard him speak in the synagogue, wondered, they would marvel at how he spoke. They wanted to know how he got that wisdom, how he could perform these mighty works. Because he was the son of God. Because he possessed that spirit fully. And verse 3 tells us his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He won't just judge in appearance only. He won't just judge by what his eyes can see. He won't just settle disputes even by the things that he can hear. And when you think about it in a courtroom, uh, when the judge makes that final ruling, there's obviously the jury as well, and they make their verdict, but then the judge pronounces that final sentence. He has the, the, the say as well too. And earthly Human judges, they have to use their their human faculties, don't they? They can only judge upon what they see in front of them. They can only judge upon what they hear as well too. But this one, the one who God will send, is the one who discerns people's hearts. He knows how even we stand before him this morning. He knows even about how our walk with the Lord is here today. Whether it's grown cold. Maybe whether this Christmas, whether we are... You know, just maybe not feeling it this Christmas. Certainly it is a difficult time and maybe you're dreading to hear what the news is going to be. Isn't it Wednesday or something? They're going to come out with another announcement. Maybe you're dreading to hear what's coming next. You know, we can be caught up in these things and we must remember. It's important for us to respond rightly to them, obviously, when we are going to do that. But it's important for us to remember and not lose hope to remember and even still uh, this Christmas time, despite what the announcements are going to bring, to remind ourselves that God is still on the throne and never lose heart. God is still on the throne. We don't know what's going to come next. We may not like the news maybe that's going to come next, but we still trust the Lord, don't we? We still trust the Lord. You know, look at what makes this king fit for office. You know, I'm thankful that the king, who is king of kings, when we look around at earthly rulers, it's been reminded in recent weeks, days and weeks, of the failings of some of our earthly rulers. Well, we are reminded that this one, when he comes, his reign's going to be perfect. He's the one who's going to be born in the line of David, and he's going to be empowered by God's spirit, but also he's going to be a fully righteous king. A perfectly righteous king. At the minute, our news headlines are filled with accusations of of corruption, uh, about people saying one thing and, and doing another. But this king will do exactly as he says. He will be morally even blameless as well. And so many of the ancient kings of Israel and the ancient Near East, so often they had often taken advantage of their people. They'd often even exploited their people. They had exploited the the poor and instead they often ruled in favor of the rich and powerful. And that's a tendency of of those in power sometimes, isn't it? They can be influenced by the rich and powerful and yet, you know, the poor can be even oppressed even more. Israel, the kings of Israel weren't listening to the common man. What, what, What was going on in Israel, the poor was being oppressed and the rich were growing fat. That's what was happening really. And and that's what actually Isaiah condemns in Isaiah 3. The poor would be taken advantage of. But God had ordained kings. And these kings were supposed to protect the poor. They were supposed to protect the helpless, the outcast. But God's promised one wasn't going to overlook the weak. He wasn't going to overlook the oppressed. He'll look upon them with tenderness, with mercy. And he's going to be one who'll judge fairly. He's going to be one who'll judge the wicked as well. Verse 4, he'll strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he'll kill the wicked. He's going to execute perfect justice because he'll possess perfect knowledge. And the day when those, in that day of judgment, those who are outside of Christ on that day, there will be no excuse because the Lord will know their hearts. They can't say they haven't heard because God's revealed himself in creation. God is even speaking to people in the midst of this pandemic as well too. Some of these things even remind us that 
you know often how helpless we are. And God is in control. And God will execute perfect justice in that day because he is the perfect, blameless judge. There is no sin in him. He will judge rightly. And the wicked should not think that they will escape forever. On that day, they will be held accountable for how they lived. In Revelation 19, verse 15, they are fulfillment of these words. Jesus one day will be the judge of the nation. He'll strike them by his word. And he'll be one, it says here, who is clothed in righteousness and faithfulness. In other words, he's one who acts rightly in all circumstances. He's just in all his decisions. He's one who's faithful and keeps God's promise. And notice it says righteousness will be like the, the belt of his waist. And do you know the belt in ancient clothing was actually quite an important part of the clothing? We sometimes think of a belt as being just something extra you, you put on. Uh, maybe at the end but no the belt actually was extremely important because in those days they wore long flowing robes so what had happened was if you were going out to say work in the fields or if you were going out to do a particularly strenuous bit of work or you needed to move quickly you would often gather those long robes and you would tuck the long robes in your belt that's why uh, if you have the authorized version or the king james it talks about girding up your loins that's really what it, it's meant it's gathering those things up and then tucking them in your belt as well. To, it, it's bringing things together. That's really what it's the expression even uh, means. It means someone making themselves ready to act. So here, this image of righteousness and faithfulness, or if you like this belt, it's like they're the, the attributes that keep everything together, that keep all these other attributes of the Messiah together. His righteousness, his faithfulness. So Jesus then, you see, is the one who we can put our trust in. Here's a king who can be trusted. Here's a king who keeps his words, who does all he says. He's the one who lives that perfect life. He fulfilled the law and all its requirements. He was the one who was willing to be that perfect offering for our sin. He was the one who God promised long before, the one who we can trust and depend. The one who, when he said, came to be the way to the Father, the one who in his sacrificial death opened that way to God for us. He is the, the promised king. He's the perfect king. So many other kings had failed, but he will not. But also finally, he's the peace-giving king. The peace-giving king. And what a wonderful picture there is in verses 6 to 9. Greatly symbolic language of, of wolves lying down with lambs, leopards lying down with goats. So basically it's talking about predators and their prey. And here they are, together lying down in peace the one who exercises dominion and rule over them isn't going to wield a, a whip or a rod but he'll wear a gentle face the face of a child verse 7 the cow and the bear shall graze you know usually the only thing bears want to graze on is meat but here they are grazing in the field the coming king will be able to transform relationships but we'll be able to transform not just relationships, but even natures as well too. He will bring about a lasting transformation as well that will endure to the next generation. Because it says the young shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. This king is one who can change hearts. This king is one who can transform lives. Verse 8, the, lion, sorry, the king will bring safety. And then we have this shocking image, and it is a shocking image. A nursing child, speaking of a child that is so helpless and dependent on another, they'll be able to play by the, the cobra's nest, by the dwelling place safety, safely. Even the weaned child, the toddler, will be able to place his hand in the, in the viper's den. You know, the toddler is one that's prone into getting into trouble quickly. And they often do things without, you know, thought as well too. You know, I remember one time seeing a very vivid illustration of this when I was in a, in, a, in a bakery and a toddler ran away from his granny out the door and into the street. And the people were chasing after him as he, you know, in case he would run out onto the road. Yet this king, you know, he is going to bring about peace and safety so that even that young child, the young defenseless child will have nothing to fear. You know, it is a, in many ways a shocking image because when you think of it, a child, so often they don't think about the danger they're in. 
Yet God is going to bring about an amazing peace. Those who trust in this king will not have reason to fear. They will have a hope that endures amidst fear. And the key to this whole change is in verse 9. The whole earth will become God's holy mountain because the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So the key you see to this transformed creation is the knowledge of the Lord. That's the key. As the Holy One, Holy God dwells with them and welcomes them into this holy place, they enter into this personal union with them. So what Isaiah has been picturing as peace between the animals, this is actually going to happen in the hearts of men and women as he returns to reign upon the earth. And here, can you see Isaiah's looking forward with eyes of faith, looking at what's going to be accomplished through this coming king. He sees that in that day, the, the, this root of Jesse will be a, a, a banner or a, a signal to the people. You know, it's like the image of a, in, a, in the battlefield often, they would carry the banner. And why they carried the banner was that sometimes there would be a banner for even certain divisions within the army. And as that banner or that signal would be raised, the people knew that's where we need to gather. So the archers would gather under their banner. The, uh, the infantry would gather under theirs as well too. Or else there would be the rallying flag even of in the midst of the battle. Those who were on either side could know very clearly and could see very clearly from a distance where their soldiers were by this banner. So in that day, the root of Jesse is going to be a banner to the people. He will gather his children to him. His children, Israel. And, you know, while this image here, it also has a wider view. Even Gentiles shall seek him. His resting place is going to be glorious. What a glorious picture this is. A day when nature shall be transformed. A day when there will be peace and nothing to fear. I don't know about you, but particularly in these times, don't you yearn even more for that day? Days of peace. Nowadays, you know, you almost don't want to switch on the news, do you, at times? Because you're wondering what's coming next. But there will be a day when all will be at peace. This king will bring reconciliation. He'll bring transformation. And this king will bring peace. Jesus is the one through whom can bring about the greatest peace we need. Through faith in him, he brought peace with God. The one who, when someone trusts in him, he transforms natures. And he provides a glorious rest for all those who trust in him. And we'll be thinking about that peace even again in our, our carol service tonight. But so as we close, you know, the Lord's timetable of events continues to advance each day. And here Isaiah is giving us a glimpse into not just his future, but also ours as well. Through him, not Isaiah, but through this promised one, new life will come. And what a comfort that is. Do you know, as God's people, no matter how hopeless maybe seem, things seem in this world, like the people in Isaiah's time, we need to remember God has not forsaken us. Don't lose heart. We are not without hope. In Christ, we have a blessed hope that nothing or no one can take away from us. We have a glorious future. So never let us lose sight of that. What a picture it talks about here. A new creation. Because while the image of this perfect world, it reminds us, doesn't it, about what Eden must have been like at the very beginning, before sin entered into the world. It's almost like that all being restored again. Even he'll gather in the nations. This world with its imperfect leaders will one day be replaced by a perfect king, a just king, and a king who is not only wise, but he is one who came in power, who comes in power. The one who God promised will come again and he will complete the work that God has for him. Now, none of the things that have happened in this past year or two has been a shock to the Lord. None of it has been a shock to him. He knew all of these things. Not it, but it's what an encouraging reminder this is that not even the schemes of Satan or the enemy can ever thwart God's plan. Nothing can thwart God's plan. This is coming about and nothing's going to defeat that. But if you're not a Christian and you're watching this today, since Jesus truly is the source of hope and life, 
since he is the one to whom all will, will one day give account. What will you do with that knowledge this Christmas? If you're not a Christian, will you turn to him in faith and trust? Will you know true blessing this Christmas? Will you come and know true peace and joy? Peace and joy that aren't just dependent on the circumstances around, it, around us, but peace and joy that's dependent on the word of God. And why can we trust this? Because God is a God of righteousness. He's a God of faithfulness. And he doesn't break his promises. He is the one who imparts the peace that this world needs at Christmas. And you can't find true peace or true lasting joy in any other. May God speak even using this word today and bless even our hearts, even for hearing it. And, and so let us close today by reminding ourselves, close the first part of our service as we go to the table very shortly, by reminding ourselves of the significance of this child who was placed in the manger in Bethlehem as we sing our final carol, Once in Royal David City.
Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, for just the sense of expectation even that Isaiah had and how that comes across to us. And Father, may it just thrill us as well too to, and cause us even to consider about even the coming kingdom and what that will be like. Father, to know that one day this broken world will be made new once again. And Father, that we have no doubt that that will happen because the one who made that promise, Lord, is able to bring that to pass. That you are true, that you are just in all your ways. That your son came to live that perfect life in order to bring us to you. And so, Heavenly Father, help us never to, to lose hope, to not despair, but to, conti- to continue to trust in you, to look to you as well. Father, just give us that wisdom in these days in which we live. How we do need that today. Father, even as, as others even look upon our lives, just even give us those opportunities to witness for you. Even as you have, even in this past week. And we do pray, Lord, that even some of those opportunities will come to fruition. That people will come to the church. That also people will even read those tracts that have been given out. And that they will come to know you. Father, use us just as instruments in your service. And Lord, help us now, even as we meet around this table. In Jesus' name, amen. Perhaps you could please turn your Bibles to Luke's Gospel. Luke's Gospel in chapter 2. I want to just read a few verses. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, and verses 4 to 7. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And when she, she gave birth to her newborn son, her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and placed him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. So you know, when we think of the description of what this Messiah was going to be like in Isaiah 11, it is a wonderful image of a wonderful king, one who, unlike those before him, one who would be effective, one who would be perfect, one who was going to do more than just bring peace, but one who would actually transform society. And the remarkable thing is that Isaiah spoke of him as coming as a child, Isaiah 53, 2. For he grew up before him like a young plant. I quoted these verses. And like a root out of a dry ground, he had no former majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He would grow up as a, a young plant and tenderness, come even in helplessness as well. Of course, he wasn't helpless. As, he, as a baby, he was, but as he grew up, he still had the very power of God. He was fully God, fully man. Do you know, in our day, nowadays, when you think of it, you know, whenever those who are in important position, those who are royalty, they may sometimes mix with members of the public, don't they? There's royal appearances. They maybe visit uh, some places. Prince William, I think, even on one occasion, slept on the streets to gain an understanding of what it was to be homeless. But he was accompanied by many others around him people for security, people also to give him that, uh, just to help him as well too. But Jesus, our Savior, didn't just come to this earth to visit it or to make an appearance. He wasn't guarded by security. But when he came to earth, he came as a baby. And it is, as I say, even that it boggles the mind, doesn't it? That one who was the very instrument through him, even the, words were, the world was created, came as just a little child to grow up as well. You know, in that, it, it is truly amazing that the king would come and dressed in swaddling clothes. He didn't come in royal finery. He came in swaddling clothes, just rags, strip, strips of cloth. But from the day he was born, he was clothed in humility. He reflected humility. And don't we see that in the upper room as he even washed his disciples' feet? 
disciples' feet, something that was the work of a servant, something that is displayed even as humility. But as Paul writes in Philippians 2, Jesus, the King of kings, in order to be the King of kings, first humbled himself. He took the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He came, became a servant. The one who deserves the very highest place came to the very lowest position. Do you know, these emblems remind us of that greatest moment of humbling as he went upon the cross to be crucified even among common criminals, to endure a death that was considered in polite society. It wasn't even spoke of such a death. It was considered shameful and cruel. Yet he did that for you and for me. The great and mighty king humbled himself for us. And as Paul reminds us in Philippians 2, we're not, just to, we're not just to marvel at that love. We're also to cultivate that mindset and our humility as well too. God's deliverance came in his time, in the fullness of time, and in his way, through his son being that suffering servant. In order for him to be exalted, he had to be brought low. In order for atonement to be made, to be made he did that for us. And Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty we might become rich. And we are spiritually rich, spiritually rich people, sorry. We possess much in Christ. Do we ever stop to consider what we truly have in Christ? Forgiveness of sins, an eternal home, security that has a relationship with us and God that nothing can take away. And praise God, our Savior. He is clothed in that heavenly glory. And one day he's going to come again, arrayed in that glory for all to see. Then he will usher in that new creation. And so the one who is humbled, who was humbled, is the highest of all. Let us give thanks that our Savior was willing to do that for us. As we partake of these emblems, we remind ourselves of how he did that, how he shed his blood, how his body was broken for us. And because of his stripes, we are healed. Let me read this passage once more in in Corinthians to us. And then our brothers are going to pray for each of the emblems. The Lord Jesus, in the night in which he's betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we do thank you for reminding us this morning about the birth of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Came from your splendor and glory to that humble stable in Bethlehem. And he came, Lord, knowing what would lie ahead in his future when he would be betrayed by Judas, forsaken by friends and disciples, arrested by the soldiers, and ultimately, Lord, condemned by Pilate, and Lord, nailed to a cross, not for anything that that, that he'd done himself, but for my sins, for the sins of the world. So now, Lord, just as we would take of this bread, which reminds us of that broken body, broken for us, broken for our sins, Accept our thanks again for our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.
Father, as we gather around this table this morning, we think of the words <clears throat> of that great hymn, Thine be the glory, risen, conquering Son. <clears throat> We've been thinking much about his birth and his life, Lord. We think about his resurrection and his rising again from the dead. And we thank you that it was all for us because we are separated from you by our sin. So, Lord, forgive us this morning that we have failed you in so many ways and help us to be more thoughtful, more grateful for what you have done for us. As we drink this wine now, Lord, we thank you for the blood that we shed for us to cleanse our sin. And we ask that you would just help us and strengthen us day by day. In his name, amen. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, that the Savior was willing to humble himself for us. That he was willing to endure even such suffering, Lord, for our sins. Father, we want to give you thanks, Lord, that you have exalted him to the, the highest place. And that, Father, for that just sure promise of your word that he is coming again. And so, Lord, in that day when he does come again, we know that this, uh, what we have just done, Lord, these emblems will not be necessary in the end because we will see you face to face. In that day, Lord, we want to give you thanks, Lord, that even we know one day there would even be a greater feast, Lord. A greater feast, Lord, when we can rejoice with all the Lord's people in glory. A day, Lord, even when people from every tongue, tribe, and nation We'll be able to lift our hearts and praise to you. And so, Lord, help us to be living even with expectation. Father, this Christmas period, help us to declare, even if people should ask of the reason of the hope that was within us, help us, Lord, to declare that, not just with our lives, but also with our lips as well. And so, Father, we do ask for your help, even for this evening, for all that will take place. In Jesus' name, amen. 